Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12062 Alternative Dispute Resolution. We're into week 11. Next week we have our take home paper. I have uploaded some material onto Moodle by way of a guide as to what you should consider in preparing for that take home exam. As you know, there are three areas where you may be examined in relation to it. Essentially, we're looking at um, the material which is covered in Moodle weeks, as I recall, seven and eight, and uh, then justice mediation. But don't ignore matters to do with legal um, issues and ethical issues, which uh, flow into all of those things. Now, are there any questions about the take home paper or the material that I posted today and sent to you by a note? All good? All right. Well, let's pick up on where we were last week. We were talking about legal issues. We were talking about statutory pr privilege. So do have a look at the key pieces of legislation at a Commonwealth level, the Federal Court of Australia Act, and look at Section 53 Cap B, which deals with the issue of admissions made to mediators. In essence, it is a statutory protection of confidentiality in the process. And a counterpart provision to that is section 36 of the Civil Proceedings Act 2011, which is the Queensland version. One thing that um, you may need to consider if you're practicing in this area is the fact that ADR practitioners can be sued um, over procedural issues. It's not likely that uh, anyone could su successfully proceed, sue them over substantive issues associated with the dispute. But the potential liability of an ADR practitioner lies in breach of contract, torts, negligence, but of course you need to establish or the other party would need to establish that there was a duty of care, there was a breach of that duty, there was an actual loss and um, there must be established a causal connection. As difficult as those things might be, they are real and uh, the mediator needs to be mindful of that. But do note the statutory immunity provisions, in particular under the Civil Proceedings Act, Queensland, Section 52, and the Federal Court of Australia Act 53C, from memory. Let's move on to talk about the enforceability of settlement agreements and dispute resolution clauses. So in both instances, the law of contract applies whether that's a deed or a contract or a consent order, um, evidence needs to be presented, which is cogent, to overcome a settlement agreement. So one of the specific exemptions to confidentiality, of course, is the fact that a party can rely upon and enforce um, an agreement which is struck at a mediation session. But what about contracts which provide for dispute resolution clauses? And depending on the nature of the question in your take home exam, this may be an area that you need to consider or, or at least touch upon. So the leading case is Scott and Avery and we call um, some clause that necessitates the um, parties to participate in dispute resolution procedures prior to litigation, a Scott and Avery clause. So the clause requires the parties to involve themselves in dispute resolution as a condition precedent to litigation. And in some ways you could mount an argument that the statutory provisions requiring parties to um, um, undertake certain pre-litigation um, procedures or steps is an extension of that principle in Scott and Avery. If you're looking at drafting a clause which is effectively a Scott and Avery clause, you need to provide requisite certainty. And the courts will certainly validate and enforce such a clause, but there are different approaches that the courts have adopted. In your text, the um, report, the uh, author, Spencer, has, I suppose, identified a number of cases, some that adopt this hard line approach, such as Elizabeth Bay Developments against Borrell Building Services and um, Alton or Aiton Australia against Transfield and others that um, uh, show a more moderate approach, such as computer share and perpetual registrars. Um, so let's have a brief look at Elizabeth Bay. 
In that case, the court considered an ADR clause. It was detailed. It referred to two external documents that were not annexed to the contract, but the external documents were inconsistent with each other and the clause itself. So the guidelines and appointment did not create sufficient certainty in the process. The parties had an, um, agreed on a mediation appointment and it was held to be unenforceable. On a separate issue, Justice Giles does deal with the good faith issue, which is um, now um, part of our uh, obligations to um, ensure that parties um, adopt a, a good faith approach and um, said that uh, the phrase aimed at determining and committing a party to a state of mind in the future, um, which cannot be possessed with certainty, um, was was difficult. So in that case, Justice Giles said that it was claimed that good faith and self-interest were mutually exclusive, resulting in the term failing. So what we're really talking about here is two things. Number one is the enforceability of a clause and the drafting of that clause in such a way as to ensure that it is certain. But then the second part is that where there is such a clause requiring parties to involve themselves in ADR process, it's very often phrased around an obligation on the parties to do so in good faith. And then we have this distinction between what is participating in good faith and what is participating in a way that is in your best interest and your self-interest. So in that case, Justice Giles said that they are mutually exclusive. The next case is um, Aiton Australia against Transfield. It's a 1999 federal court decision. It's 153 FLR 236. The mediation clause was found to be uncertain as the mechanism for the appointment of the mediator's costs um, was um, uncertain and the clause was not severable from the negotiation clause. Now on the good faith issue that I mentioned earlier, Justice Einstein, um, Einstein said that good faith was not inconsistent with acting in one's self-interest. He ruled that the obligation to act in good faith is recognised as an implied obligation and that doesn't require you championing in good faith the other's cause over your own interests, but it does require you to have an open mind to consider and put forward options and does require anyone to act, uh, but it doesn't require you to act in anything other than your own interests. So the obligation there is simply to demonstrate that you have complied with the obligation by essentially being a good listener, participating, considering reasonably anything which is presented to you, even though you're not under any obligation to do something which is against your own interests. So consequently, the law was left unsettled because we had different terminology there in relation to the issue of good faith um, and negotiations. The moderate approach was taken in computer share against perpetual registrars, and it's a 2000 case. Um, again, it's referred to in your textbook. And in that case, the court found the agreements to negotiate were capable of being enforced. The dispute resolution clause was, um, despite the clear intention of the parties um, in a yet to be prescribed dispute resolution process was considered. Also consider United Group Rail against Rail Corp, which is a 2009 case and a clause that dealt specifically with mediation will need to state more than the name of the mediation organization and it requires the parties to negotiate in good faith. And in that case, the court said that that term in good faith may no longer be void from certainty. My personal view is that these clauses that require parties to participate in good faith are now more likely to be upheld consistently than was the case many years ago. And the reason I say that is that the good faith mechanisms, if you like, are now being built into the statutes and there's a requirement for parties to participate in ADR process 
as a precursor to um, um, litigation in many instances. So participants um, in um, good faith issues need to consider the other side's perspective and be shown to have at least considered the other side's perspective. I mentioned statutes, have a look at the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act, section 34A, subsection three, which says that um, under statute, parties referred to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal for ADR are required to act in good faith. Now there's some commentary about what we mean by good faith beyond what we've already said. And um, the AAT has some material in that regard. Uh, there's a publication I think called The Duty of, to Act in Good Faith in ADR Processes. And it says good faith means a party makes a genuine effort, a term that we see often now, to contribute to ADR and resolve disputes in the simplest and most cost-effective way. And that obligation is now going beyond the parties to involve lawyers. And we talked about some of those specific provisions last week that impose those mandatory obligations on lawyers to act in a way that uh, represents good faith. For example, look at section 37M and 37N um, of the Federal Court Act. So there are some of the legal issues that may be relevant to your assessment work, um, but certainly tailor um, or colour, if you like, ADR processes. The textbook has a good chapter on this. Have a look at what David Spencer says about the voluntary nature of mediation and a party's obligation, if you like, to negotiate in good faith. I don't think that they're inconsistent. Um, there was a suggestion that how can you have a voluntary process yet mandate that parties must negotiate in good faith? Surely that takes away from the voluntary nature of the proceedings. I'm not sure that it does. All right, let's move on to chapter 10 material, which is ethics and standards. Um, ethical standards are very important in the ADR process. ADR, remember, of course, was developed through professional organisations. Leaving aside, um, you know, uh, arbitration, etc., which uh, in the industrial realm has been around for a long time. But mediation, conciliations, as we practice it now, is relatively new. We now have specialist ADR practitioners. We have those um, practitioners that are accredited at a national level. And during the, the 90s, there was no particular governing body. So there came a groundswell of opinion as to whether we need a governing body, whether we need to create rules and establish some form of accreditation regime for what is an effectively a newly created profession, which was more than just lawyers. It uh, goes well beyond lawyers. So there are mediators that, are, um, that don't uh, have legal qualifications. And in doing that, <clears throat> there were questions about the extent to which consumer laws, tort law, contract law should apply generally to dispute resolution practitioners. And I've already mentioned that they do. There was a question whether we need a special code of conduct for ADR practitioners. And it follows then from that, whether we need special ethical standards to apply to ADR practitioners, those who act in a facilitative way, as opposed to those who act in a determinative fashion, such as arbitrators. <clears throat> Are there insurance consequences that apply for those practitioners that work in the ADR field? And um, uh, is there a, a problem here, essentially, that lawyers have, solicitors particularly, have huge insu indemnity insurance premiums, and how can they compete in a business model against those who are not lawyers, who have little or perhaps no um, indemnity insurance cover, and uh, is there some way of finding a middle ground here? So uh, much of that was catered for through the National Accreditation Program, which is through the Mediator Standard Boards, 
and I'd encourage you to look into that. Um, and even then, there are different categories of national accreditation or add-ons, if you like. For example, I'm nationally accredited mediator, but I'm not a family dispute resolution practitioner, which is a different um, accreditation process, but you need to be nationally accredited in order to become a family dispute resolution practitioner. So, um, for example, while I might mediate property disputes in family law, only FDR practitioners could mediate disputes in relation to parenting issues. So we have, if you like, this growing issue of ethical standards, but in order to apply the ethical standards, we have to understand or at least agree upon what ADR practitioners are. Are they standalone professionals or are they undertaking work as part of their existing profession? As recently as two years ago, the Bar Association amended the barrister's rules to specifically state that mediation work is barrister's work. Um, and it's extraordinary that that's only occurred in the last or well, less than two years ago um, to formally identify that it is part of what barristers do, for example. So um, there are a few questions. Are ADR practitioners covered by existing indemnity insurance policies? Should specialist ADR practitioners have their own indemnity policies? And should that policy relate to all types of ADR practice or only specific types? I'm raising more questions than I'm answering. And part of the reason for that is that we don't necessarily have settled answers on a lot of these issues now. So the issue of ethical matters is difficult because whilst in this degree, which is a law degree, of course, you may be inclined to answer any ethical question by reference to the Legal Practitioners Act, by reference to the Solicitor's Conduct Rules or the Barrister's Rules, there is potentially a wider reach than that in terms of ethical obligations for ADR practitioners, those that are not lawyers. I know I'm doing a lot of talking and I'm motoring a little bit to catch up, but are there any questions? Hi, John, I was just going to say, um, just on the insurance point, in order for me to get my accreditation with the um, National Board, I had to provide a letter from my from the Department of Health, as it was at the time, stating that I was covered by them from, from an insurance perspective. Excellent. Oh, thank you, Jackie. That's, that's very good. So um, it looks as though there is that requirement to ensure that there is at least some coverage for the practices that are undertaken by ADR practitioners. Thank you. All right, so in terms of, let's, let's assume then that there are ethical standards. One of the issues is how do we document that? Diane, do you have any questions? No? Okay. Um, do we need quality benchmarks? How do we satisfy computer demand, or customer demand rather, or uh, consumer demand? How do we deal with feedback issues? And how do we deal with the accreditation and then registration process? So for example, and um, Jackie may have gone through the same situation, in order to be nationally accredited, you need to undertake a special course of uh, study and then undertake an examination, which is a live examination situation. All right, so the starting point for any discussion should, I think, be the um, mediator standards. Have a look at the Law Council of Australia. It provides some guidelines. It talks about the process um, and it talks about the requirements for a mediator to ensure that um, parties are aware of the process. The parties have an opportunity to identify their real concerns and their options that the um, mediator or ADR practitioner is impartial, avoids complex, con conflicts of interest, is competent and uh, retains confidentiality issues. So look at the NMAS, uh, the National Mediator Accreditation Standards Board, and um, they're all uh, required, stated there. So in the chat facility, Jackie has just reminded, we're talking about cases in chapter eight of the text and um, we're on to now 
ethical standards, sorry. So um, in terms of ethics, one of the cases that you might want to consider is the case of Mullins. Um, that is an important case in terms of uh, the way in which mediators need to deal with ethical issues. Um, so in Mullins case, we had a situation where the mediator was, sorry, well, we had a situation where a, a lawyer was uh, acting in a mediation situation and it was to do with an insurance claim. The lawyer had certain information which was not disclosed to the other side during the course of negotiations. Had that information, which was only known to one side, been explained to the other side, that is very likely to have substantially changed the amount of money that was offered at the mediation. It came out at a later time, and in that case, the um, uh, lawyer was penalised for having effectively withheld information which had the effect of misleading the other side. It was a tough decision, but it, it's one that you need to be aware of. So um, consider Mullen's case in that context. Now, I should say that um, ethics is not directly going to be part of your assessment regime, but it is something that you must consider <clears throat> when you're answering any question on ADR. And indeed, if you're answering any questions that I, I said, um, quite often I will say specifically, please consider ethical issues. Uh, there may not be any that are specifically um, identified, but you should always consider ethical issues. For example, if you're looking at uh, answering a case um, and you're hypothetically involved in a law firm, doing a conflict check is always a good idea to make sure that you're not acting for someone who the firm had previously acted against. You're not acting against someone you know, in circumstances where the firm had previously acted for that person. I hope that makes sense. All right, I know that was a very brief overview of ethical issues, but are there any questions in relation to that? All good? All right. One of the themes that we've talked about in the last few weeks is dispute prevention. And NADRAC has some very good information on dispute prevention. So of the three potential areas of um, examination next week, you may be involved in dealing with dispute, resolu d dispute prevention as opposed to necessarily dispute resolution. So according to NADRAC, there are some ways to prevent disputes. And I'll just go through a list of these, uh, but by all means, look for this and be prepared to refer to it in your material. Dispute prevention requires you to be open to others' points of view, to give everyone a chance to communicate their points of view in a respectful manner, to listen, to try to understand the other points of view, to find out what the other people want, for example, by simply asking them, think of the other people as equal or different um, and different and accept some or all of the needs of the people involved. So if, for example, you are preparing something that relates to dispute prevention, I wonder if you need to include some of that type of material. It may seem fairly obvious. It may seem fairly trite, but I think it's powerful if it's, if it's reduced to writing and particularly powerful in circumstances where parties make a commitment to be bound by those um, general philosophical statements. And we, we talked about that in the context of partnering and those types of dispute prevention procedures that are least interventionist. So don't be afraid to refer to, in fact, I encourage you to refer to NADRAC in that regard. Um, that might be relevant if you're preparing something that relates to partnering dispute advisory, dispute advisors or dispute review boards um, in particular, but it can also work in more formal types of uh, ADR practice. <clears throat> so just um, remind yourself, if you like, of some of the ways that you can encourage parties, if you're in that situation, to think about managing differences and some of the reframing skills, for example, that we talked about early in the unit. 
I'm not suggesting that you include those specifically in your material if you're preparing something about dispute prevention, but keep that in mind. Um, and it may be that you include some of those in your philosophical statement. So I'll just give you some examples rather than sort of talking generally. So if you're talking about managing difference of opinion as part of dispute prevention, then apart from having, if you like, the, the mantra of what parties are expected to do and how they're expected to commit, there are the more specific mechanisms that we've learnt during this unit. For example, active listening. And you may say that um, part of, you might actually include that as an obligation for the parties to act, actively listen, um, to respond respectfully, um, to avoid making accusations or personal statements or derogatory comments, um, to identify issues as important rather than rely upon dogmatic um, uh, principles or uh, things of that nature. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make, perhaps inelegantly, is that many of those techniques that you've learnt during the first part of the unit might be framed as part of the material that you include specifically in the dispute resolution documentation that you might draw if that's the question that you're asked to, to consider. And you can be creative too. Um, so for example, at QCAT, there's Tribunal Practice Direction number one of 2012, which I think uh, Nicholas included in his excellent summary document. Um, there's a practice direction about QCAT's hybrid hearings. Also look at the use of ex expert conclaves, which is uh, part of uh, QCAT. Have a look at practice direction number four of 2009 in that regard. So other courts, other tribunals may have something similar to that as well. Um, Jackie, do they have anything like the conclaves, expert conclaves at the AAT? I'm oh, sorry, at, at um, work cover? Sorry, so what exactly is a conclave, an yeah, expert conclave? Uh, expert conclave is um, essentially a mediation between mm -hmm. experts. So the idea is that if you have, for example, an engineering dispute or a building dispute and both parties are looking to introduce experts as part of their case, um, it's a, a useful technique for, if you like, dispute prevention or dispute minimization to build in a process where the parties, the experts, are required to meet effectively in a mediation type situation or a conciliation conference where mm. they then thrash out the issues of concern and their commitment is to come to an agreement about certain things and then identify clearly where they disagree and why they disagree. So it's all, that's, that's part of dispute resolution as well. Does that make okay. sense, Jackie? Yeah, yeah. So I guess, I mean, we maybe don't have something so focused like that, but, but there's different types. So obviously you've got your conciliation or mediation with people like me who are not members but then when it does go to a member you can have a member assisted conciliation which is similar to our process but they don't make a decision so that it's it's still facilitative or it might go to a determinative conference where a decision is made and it's in private so or you, you've got your full-on public hearing as well which is different so i guess you know the maybe the determinative conference might be similar okay yes so maybe mm. along those lines all right thank you very much jackie so the reason i'm raising that particularly is if you're building if you're creating and you can be very creative with this some sort of dispute prevention um mechanism do you build in a mechanism where the experts do not run on parallel train tracks until we get to the end of the to the the end of the resolution. But do you build in a process where they are required to meet and come up with an agreement about what uh, a statement as to what they agree upon, what they disagree upon, and why? 
All right. So, um, sorry, you mean that is as part of dispute prevention? Yes, I do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I so, think so. so. Have an expert conclave uh, as a step in part yep. of, like an expert determination. Yes. Well, it could be. It could appraisal. be. It could be either. Um, yes. So when we're talking about expert determination or case appraisal, we're usually doing that in the context of civil litigation, and it works fine. But it's usually where an expert is, if you like, appointed to make an appraisal or make a determination. What I'm talking about is a little different. So if we imagine, for example, that you're required to build a dispute prevention process in the context of a building project, you might say, well, part of what we need to do is ensure that the experts that the, bar, the parties might produce have a chance at an early stage to have a meaningful direct dialogue, but do it in a structured way so that you build in a, a situation where there is a meeting. That meeting is, if you like, overseen by an ADR practitioner and you set specific objectives and rules around that meeting, which I'm calling an experts enclave, so that the experts are required to come up with this list of this agreement between them. We agree, sign it, date it. Here's what we agree upon. Here are the facts where we agree. You can take that as being a given. Here are the, here are the um, processes where we agree. Here are the processes where we disagree. And here are the conclusions that we've come to and where we disagree, this is why we disagree. Does that make sense, B? Okay. It's a bit right. like the, the uh, civil liability kind of situation. Yes, it, it is, yeah. But it's building it in out of a court context. So we're not part of the court process, but it's an agreement. Okay. Okay. All right, so they're just some potential ideas. Let's make a start on ADR and criminal law process, restorative justice. Now, restorative justice may take several forms. Primarily, most commonly, justice mediation, but it might also refer to case conferencing, which is, if you like, for want of a better term, the counterpart of the American uh, plea bargaining, or it might be youth justice conferencing, or it might be diversion techniques such as drug diversion. So all of those I'm categorising as criminal law ADR procedures. But mostly when I talk about restorative justice, I'm mostly talking about justice mediation, um, which is one of the three primary areas for your, um, your take-home exam, potentially. Now, in terms of material, I would recommend that you look at some of the material that I posted today in Moodle, starting with the Queensland Police Service Operations Manual. It's something that is available to the public and uh, I've provided you with a link. You can look at all of it if you wish, but particularly for our purposes, have a look at page 95 onwards and you'll see some commentary there about police procedures and prosecutorial procedures around ADR practice. I mentioned case conferencing. Now, since I've been practicing, we've always been involved in a form of case conferencing, but from 2010, it was legitimized, if I can say that, and built in, structured in to the criminal law process. This came about as a result of what's called the Moynihan reforms. So it formalised the process of case conferencing at the magistrate's court level um, and it's adopted throughout Queensland and there are particular ways of trying to resolve issues in criminal law between defence and prosecution. So when we talk about case conferencing, we're talking about defence, prosecution, we're not directly involving the parties, if you like, the perpetrator and the victim. We're dealing with, if you like, the representatives, the representative on behalf of the state and the representative on behalf of the defendants. And it's, there's a formalised process for that now. So that's case conferencing. The second type of ADR process is 
to do with children. It's called Youth Justice Conferencing. And the idea is that um, uh, the children meet with the victim in a formal procedure. Police prosecution or police representatives are there. A lawyer can be there but has little to say under this, under this um, scheme. Um, there might be, and the victim will be there, uh, there might be youth justice um, representatives as well. So this is pretty close to adult justice mediation model. The idea is that um, the defendant child can then be sentenced based on what he or she agrees to do at the youth justice conference, or it can be returned to court and a formal order is made. So it's a diversion process that works well, and it's surprisingly difficult for the young offenders to find themselves in that formal, if you like, almost scary process where they confront their victims. It also sometimes helps the victims because they see a face and instead of necessarily being scared of, of who they're dealing with, they get to see that it's a young child. Um, so it can have some positive effects for the victim as well. I won't talk any more about that, but the Youth Justice Conference um, regime has been around for a while. It's come and go, uh, gone a bit, but it works very well. The next is drug diversion. And essentially for certain defendants charged with relatively straightforward drug matters, usually possession of drugs of a low level or, or a low quantity, or both, um, or possession of a thing like a utensil um, and other sorts of charges, the defendant can be diverted to drug diversion programs either directly by the police so that they don't go to court at all, or from the court if they, but by, both ways they need to plead guilty to the offence and they need to be eligible. So, you know, people with certain um, offences in their past, uh, sexual offences, certain drug offences, matters of violence, they're not eligible to, to go to drug diversion. But it's a very good way of dealing with a defendant if you want to avoid a criminal conviction or a criminal conviction that is recorded. So from a defence perspective, um, seeking out and, taking, and encouraging your client to take advantage of drug diversion is a very sensible approach in many circumstances, even though it does require a plea of guilty or a statement of guilt. So that's a diversion process. I'm not going to examine you on any of these matters, but I'm going through, the, if you like, the list to identify that there is more than one ADR practice, practice associated with um, criminal law practice. Another one is special to stalking charges. In section 359F of the criminal code, it's possible for a court to um, have a defendant sign a restraining order. And in fact, the defendant may seek formal, to avoid formal prosecution by signing that. So the restraining order is um, a, a circumstance where the defendant um, effectively is imposing a, um, an injunction, a mandatory injunction upon themselves not to have contact with directly or indirectly or approach or follow um, the victim of the alleged stalking. Um, the court can also impose other conditions to that. So if you've got someone who's on stalking charges, that may be an appropriate way to deal with the matter. And also it may provide some comfort to a victim to know that there is, if you like, this formalised arrangement in place to avoid the potential or minimise the potential for stalking in the future. So there, the, if you like, the other criminal law mediation, or other criminal law ADR practices. But let's talk about justice mediation in the, in the adult context. <clears throat> it's a bit like child um, youth justice conferencing in that the idea is that the alleged perpetrator and the victim, if you like, meet face to face. It's not going to be suitable in many situations, but it is suitable in some. I think I've mentioned before, if you have a fight between, say, brothers, um, instead of the matter proceeding through an assault charge in the court, it might be better to have a justice mediation. Likewise, fraud charges, stealing charges, 
property related matters where the victim is potentially not going to recover uh, all or some of the um, that which is lost then a mediation process may be a beneficial way to proceed but either way it needs to be confidential and it needs to be voluntary it is a diversion program but it's for adult criminal law matters and it's all justice mediation is based around restorative justice process and restorative justice principles so as part of your background reading to um, prepare for the take-home exam do have a look at restorative justice principles and do some reading about if you like the definitions of restorative justice um, how it's administered in practice and why it's administered so in essence it's an opportunity for repair of damage caused through criminal behavior and i'm not talking just in terms of property damage but psychological damage as well arguably to the perpetrator but most importantly to the victim it might also provide an opportunity for some reckoning and it may be that the part perpetrator has an opportunity to address underlying issues such as alcohol or drug usage and to seek out appropriate remedies rather than necessarily being jailed where in those circumstances whilst there may be some rehabilitative nature to it it's not necessarily going to address the underlying issues so restorative justice is about restoration of a degree of harmony that might not otherwise exist very useful i think in family situations as well now it is formalized but it's not formalized throughout all of queensland due to budgetary or other reasons justice mediation formally is only offered in some major centers it's not for example often in the wide bay where i practice so um, it's useful from a defense strategy to consider justice mediation but where it's uh, not available formally then uh, usually you need to consider appointing a mediator to act as the um, uh, what to do what the department of justice would normally do through the um, justice mediation session so it's um, very useful for a defense because it potentially means that the matter is not dealt with through the criminal law system the prosecutor invariably will offer no evidence in the event of successful outcome at a justice mediation session and um, the um, therefore you can see the great benefits for a defendant particularly if you like someone who is unlikely to reoffend and has made a mistake and it's a great way of um, avoiding the stigma and the practical issues associated with having a conviction now it's possible to have referral from the court to justice mediation have a look at the justices act and look at sections 53 and look at section 88 uh, 1b so and these matters that involve mediation justice mediation can potentially be quite serious even matters to do with bodily harm or stealing as a servant can be dealt with now in the material that i've provided you i think i've given you um, some material to help you with your reading um, legal aid queensland um, have a, a good video on this i'm not i haven't uploaded it but it you may be able to to access that but the starting point i think in your research if you haven't already started would be the queensland government adult restorative justice conferencing webpage it has a lot of useful information i'd also read the legislation around this topic and then there's some material that i've uh, provided you on moodle and i think sent to you um, through an email today there's some material from the law reform commission of western australia and in particular a very good paper by harry blagg which was um, part of the research process in 2008 when the west australian government was looking at introducing this as part of its law reform commission reports and uh, in that 
Um, the author talks about the definition of restorative justice, talks about the need for it, the appropriateness of it, and the fact that in reality, um, the criminal justice situation uh, system should be more than simply punishing the offender. It should be just as much, if not more, aimed at towards of healing the effects of the crime. And that's the main impetus of restorative justice principles. So it's um, a way of resolving issues. So have a look at Harry Blagg's article in that regard. I've also referred you to um, NADREC, always a great source. So if you've anything to do with ADR, think about going to NADREC at an early stage to see if there's anything written. A lot of work has gone into NADREC. It's a pity it's now defunct. But in particular, I've referred you to dispute resolution terms, and you'll see there's some definitions there. Um, I think I've given you some material articles by Donald Schmidt in relation to um, restorative justice and how it's um, to be built into policy arrangements. And there's an article by uh, Larson as well in that regard, and some material by Strang and Sherman about restorative justice. So they are um, uh, some excellent resources for you to consider. I've also referred you to a couple of, if you like, commercial enterprises that we're in America, this has become a much more serious, if you like, important matter. Um, there are now schools that provide for accreditation in restorative practice generally as a specialty. So that's the um, International Institute for Restorative Practices and also um, the Restorative Justice International Organization is an association with many members and affiliates and that just gives you and I've given you a reference to it but it gives you an idea of the extent to which this is growing in the United States it really hasn't taken off to the same level in Australia at this stage so if you have a question about restorative justice it may be that the questions relate to the background the theory the circumstances when it can apply or it may be that it relates to how this can be developed into the future and, and where is it leading. So it's all about restorative practice. So I hope that gives you some idea or some guide as to where you should read. Now, in terms of preparing for the assessment, I have no difficulty at all in you collaborating with your colleagues. So if you want to discuss the material, exchange ideas, all of that's fine. Even when you are, when I present the assessment, um, I don't mind if you collaborate in terms of discussing it. So in the same way that you might, if uh, even if there was an assessment, like a, a, um, an in-class assessment, sorry, a, um, an assignment. So rather than say, no, you're not allowed to talk about this to each other, I'd rather make it very clear that you can discuss these aspects, exchange information and ideas, talk about some of the issues. Uh, all I'd ask is that ultimately the work that you produce is your own. I hope that clarifies things. Now, are there any questions about that very brief introduction to restorative justice, which we can talk about at more length next week or continue if you like, um, or some of the procedures we've talked about. And I'm I know, sorry, I was just having a, a question about, uh, sorry, go back to the dispute uh, prevention. Is it, po because I know some of the cases talk about two tier kind of thing. So is that, that is that part of it? Or like, first part is the mediation thing, bit, prevention. And then if that fails to go to a more evaluative process, or is that already out of the scope? No, no, that's, that's not out of the scope. So if you're looking at a dispute prevention model, I think it's sensible to probably ideally deal with something which provides a mechanism for good communication openness and honesty at an early stage, whatever that might be, and then to build in some sort of facilitative type ADR process, probably mediation. And you can go beyond that in, in a third tier, 
which provides some sort of determinative mechanism, which then brings in the whole Scott and Avery type provisions. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I guess the main emphasis is that at the early stage of that process. Now the, um, what was that question, Diane? The name of the Queensland government? You're, you're oh, oh yes. About a Queensland government adult, and there was like uh, another three words, but I missed them. Yes, yeah, sorry. So what you need to do is go to the, um, um, let's see, the Adult Restorative Justice Conferencing webpage for Queensland Government, which is the Department of Justice. So Adult Restorative Justice Conferencing. I think I've provided a link for you in the material today, but sorry, I rattled it off too quickly. Oh, Kate's got it already. Thank you, Kate. So you'll see that in the chat facility. Legal mediation and justice of the peace, settling disputes out of court, restorative justice. Thank you. All right. Um, just, just to round off, if you'd like, some further comments about the second possible area of examination, which is to do with the um, <clears throat> statutory schemes. Nicholas, I think, did include this in the material, but some practice directions from the Land Court, practice direction number one of 2015 is very useful. Practice direction number two of 2015, and I think I mentioned this last week as well, is useful. Then in the Planning and Environment Court, have a look at practice direction number two of 2014. All right. Any questions then about what we've discussed tonight? Because that is essentially the unit now. So that means that next week on Monday, we have an opportunity for generally reviewing material and asking questions. Yes, B? So oh, I was just thinking, no, next Monday, is it a public holiday? <laughs> no. It's the following Monday. I don't, I don't know. I normally work through public holidays. I know that's terrible, but I'll be online next Monday. And it is next Monday is a public holiday in Queensland. Right. So, well, I'll be but here. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay. If anyone wants to join me in New South Wales also. And I think, um, now can someone remind me when I release this? I think it's, to be careful about this. Is it the way I was, was going to ask that, John, because in the email you sent out today, you suggested that you're going to release it on Wednesday, the 4th of October. But initially in Moodle, it said the 3rd of October. Right. Let me just have a look. Yeah. So I'm initially good. it said the 3rd due back on the 4th. And now you say you're releasing it on the 4th. No, sorry. I, I, I read that three times before I sent it as well. According to my notes, I'm releasing it on Wednesday, the 3rd of October at 6.30 p.m. And it's due on Thursday, the 4th of October at 11.45 p.m. So I hope, is that consistent with what everyone has? Yeah, that's consistent with what right. was in Moodle. That's all right, John. But it's all good. What I sent today. All right. No, it's not what I'd you better, said today, I'd but it's okay. a, I will send a, a correction. Thank you very much. Workload. Um, but I did read that several times. So. And, and the other thing was, I don't know if everybody got the email or has checked um, section 11 in Moodle. John put up the document today with all, pretty much all of the information on restorative justice. And everything we spoke about last week and that John's reiterated again this week outside of restorative justice is pretty much in the document that I've added into the Moodle side as well. So you have all the direct links to everything. And I actually even put down all the reference numbers, section numbers and every other number you need so you don't have to read through all the documents in their entirety. Thank you, Nicholas, and that was excellent. So thank you very much. Pre really appreciate that. Okay. 
All right, well, thank you for your patience tonight. Thank you all for your participation. Next week is essentially review. I will send a, an amending note to confirm the actual dates, uh, which are consistent with what was originally stated in Moodle. All right, all the best, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.